Um, the Gulf is named for John Savage, but it well lives up to his name. It's uh, we're descending at Still Point, and uh, how many are going on that? Got to see a show of hands. Okay, great. Um, we took a party about this size on the uh, about the middle of, I guess of. of I can't remember, it's about a month ago. Um, Bill Howell over here at the, in their cottage and uh, uh, his wife and we had uh, a, a Swiss a professor uh, who's uh, one of the Swiss descendants, Klopper Almond from the University of Maryland who's really one, was the one that spearheaded the request to go and uh, he was going back. He's the world authority on Russian economy. And they gave, gave me. Some, I stayed with him the night before. He t told me some stories of Gorbachev and and uh, some of the experiences over in Russia that were wonderful. Um, Hal Adams, who's 74, went with us. Um, Hal is the hero of Virginia now because he's been restoring the Hunterwald farm. And when the renovation here was going to destroy and demolish the Hopper cottage, he moved it over and restored it just across the road over here. So he's, uh, him and his wife live at uh, Lover's Leap Cottage, which is one of the premier views out, out here. It's just out on the Grass Ridge Road, the first house on the left. And uh, he had been in the Gulf before, but he wanted to go back. Uh, he has a little disintegration of his tendon, so he, he walked with a bit of a shuffle, but I was happy to, and his daughter went with him, and Bill accompanied him carefully, and we watched him. He had a stick, and he, and he made it down and back without a fall. However, Dr. Almond was not so lucky. He fell, I heard a terrible blow, fell on the rock, his shoulder badly, and uh, broke his stick, it sounded like. And uh, afterwards he said a four-foot copperhead crawled out from under the rock and gave him a, a look and went away. You know, <laughs> we can be grateful for big favors. Um, the copperheads live in these loose uh, colluvial uh, rock um, collages that they're, so, they're sort of slowly slipping down to the bottom of the gulf. Um, they're very friendly people. They've never met bad people. So if you meet up with any of our friendly snakes, just don't pat them on the head, just, just give them their space and, and smile back at them and they won't learn bad manners. As long as you keep your hands and feet off of them, they usually don't bother you. I sat down beside one one day and had lunch out on this point because I didn't want any of the kids with me to mess with it. And, and uh, well, 11 of our Sierra Clubbers hiked past the rattlesnake before the 12th one said, hello, ain't that a rattlesnake? <laughs> and it was a big one, and his tail was coiled under him, so he didn't rattle, so, or she didn't rattle. But anyway, um, Savage Gulf is an absolute wonderful place. And the trees are big, that's why they're big, because it's so difficult of access. Uh, Mr. Werner Sr., the Werners came here with the Swiss settlement. Um, this area was after the Civil War. Um, President Andrew Johnson was in the White House, and um, a consul named Plumacher uh, said, uh, where can we bring some Swiss citizens? They were having some civil unrest in that country, and they needed some place to immigrate. So Johnson said, why don't you try Grandi County? It's be the closest to Switzerland you're going to find around here. Good land cheap. So Peter Staub uh, brought, bought, brought a, a colony over and bought about 1,600 acres of land over here in what was called a field, Grootley. And Grootley is still the little name and the center for the Swiss uh, people who've descended here. So that uh, colony prospered. They made wine and cheese and grew land uh, richer than it was when they started. And uh, finally, the Swiss are smart. They began to look around and see what else they could do. So Mr. Fachnock went to Chattanooga and made trucks and truck beds and made a fortune. He used to own the Turner Cottage over here. Fala Ha and her husband were at Clarksville. They went into catering business, he traveled with American Airlines and that sort of thing. And so uh, Grady York was one of the, his father was a Vernley from Manchester, and uh, he became a banker. Anyway, the, the Swiss people have left a, a good impact here because uh, the Verna family believed in selection cutting, not clear cutting. And that was the, the style that had kept uh, European forests going for many years. And so that, that mode kept uh, the attitude that they would cut the savage timber when it was ripe and ready. 
well, it was several hundred years old, when uh, a right of way from the mill with the narrow gauge, with the, not was narrow gauge, just regular gauge railway lot track was laid out. Um, and, and the landowner said, you can have a right of way through here. And after a year, Mr. Werner got busy with other things. He didn't get to cut the trees. So when he came back, the man said, well, you had your chance. You can't have a right of way again. And that was that. So uh, Warner had other business. They had coal and lumber as well. They had a big operation at Tracy City. So that's how that stand of virgin timber came to be. And then his um, son or grandson, I believe it would be Sam Warner, um, got interested in Jeeps and military vehicles and his son Bud. And uh, they got busy and had a big time collecting stuff like that. If you go through Tracy City, you'll see um, woods uh, rusting parts of, of military vehicles. If you want any part of anything, you can get it. But uh, Werner was uh, an interesting character. Uh, it was a hobby for him. He had something like $17 million worth of land, but he was just um, not interested in that. He was interested in his Jeeps. One guy stopped one day. I was sitting there under a shade tree talking to him and said, I hear you got Jeeps for sale. Mr. Warner said, yeah, there's one in that uh, wooden crate over there if you want it. And he said, you mean to tell me there's a Jeep in that box? And Mr. Werner said, if you doubt my word, you get off my land and you go now. <laughs> and off he went. <laughs> no sale. <laughs> so that's the kind of personality it took to hold on to a million dollars worth of veneer uh, and, and, and then some. And I first heard of Savage Gulf when I went to a conference in Wisconsin in 64. I just hired on and the <clears throat> Latvian accent professor said, what are you doing to save Savage Gulf and May Prairie? And I had not heard of either one, so I uh, got busy, got back down here and went to Mr. Werner and he said, I'd like to see those big trees reseed the whole plateau. And so uh, I got his drift, and, but he says, you better hurry, the taxes is eating me up. So he, he uh, gave us the time and then we, by great luck, uh, we elected a younger governor, I believe 42 at that time from Memphis, who I happened to have made a talk at his church in Memphis by quite good luck. And he, he knew me and I knew him. And uh, I said, Governor, don't you want to stretch your legs? I could see that he was a first Republican in 50 years, and the Democrats were giving him what fur down there. And he said, yeah, I believe we would. So I, he came up by helicopter. We, we took horses from right here, out, up, down the Grassy Ridge Fire Tower Road, up the stage road, and then hiked out through Still Point, where we're going to go down today, and then out to the Werner Line, where Jeeps took us then up on the other side and made a grand round, and the governor says, it's so pretty, let's buy it. So the legislature had passed a Tennessee Natural Areas Act in 71, and by 72, we were in negotiation with the Werners, and by 73, we had our second natural area, Savage Gulf. The first was Radnor Lake. So that's how this um, began. And of course, this assembly here, I'm sure you know the history that the uh, John Armfield was the largest slave trader in the world in New Orleans. And he concluded before the Civil War that was a rotten business. And he, he gave it up, moved up here. And uh, I believe the man Dahlgren for that avenue over there in Natchez Trace had the largest number of slaves uh, in his uh, operation in Natchez, Mississippi. So uh, this thing was started as a place to get away from it all. They got away from the yellow fever of New Orleans and Memphis and moved up to the mountains where the air was cleaner. And uh, teach me the faith of the mountains, serene and sublime, the deep-rooted joy of living one day at a time, leaving the petty possessions the valley folk buy for the glory of glad windswept spaces where earth meets the sky. That's, that's what we got here. And so this assembly, had they had a jazz band, they had Creole cooks, and they had up to 400 people a night, and they had a lot of good times here. Um, after the Civil War, things were pretty rocky, and uh, some of the boys, uh, if you want to read stories about it, Mary Knowles Murphy, who at that time women weren't thought to be smart enough by the men to write books, so she had to call herself Charlie Egbert Craddock in order to get published, but she is the family for whom Murfreesboro is named, and she documented all these wonderful mountain stories up here in her series of books on, on the, the Cumberland, so watch for those, they should be around. And so this whole area has been over the years kind of off to the side, remote. Uh, unfortunately now roads are being improved. Uh, 
there's no planning and zoning in rural Tennessee County, so subdivisions are hopscotching closer and closer. Everybody nowadays wants to be next to a waterfall or a scenic view. Cliff tops at Mount Eagle was one of the first. <coughs> Fairfield Glade was another. So the Yankees are coming, and uh, especially those that don't speak Spanish. And uh, we are beginning to see a tremendous increase in migration into Tennessee. So what's happened now is that the, the ragged borderlines that we thought we, we were able to defend back in the 60s when we started buying land here for $50 an acre now are going, uh, went for 500 now it's going anywhere from, could be 150000 an acre if you could find it, uh, depending on where you are. So we're in a real struggle now and we've formed a Friends of South Cumberland Coalition and they are raising private money. Uh, we just had a meeting right before last. I'll tell you more about it tonight. Um, but we uh, we need all the friends we can get, and that's why we're glad to see you all here. You are the true believers who love the plants and vegetables, and I think it's uh, great that we're going to get out and look at it. And I'm going to shut up and take a pit stop, and I wonder if there's any questions or comments. We're going to go out and drive out. And maybe the, the ranger may join us come light on your shoulder, the butterfly of happiness. And it's so nice we have a butterfly spurt with us. I call them flutter bys because they do flutter by. How close will that thing go? That'll do it. I'm pretty close right All there. All right. Yeah. You, I'm sure you have. Yeah. And he knows that I'm a salty dog, or she does. <laughs> so they prospect me pretty regular. Uh, when you've been working for the state as long as I have, you work up a sweat. Just thinking about it because... Uh, Politics is the art of the possible, and sometimes it's also the absurd, as you all know. But um, this, uh, this place has produced some incredible people um, around in the vicinity. Folks come up here because, number one, they're different. Number two, their spirits are open. And uh, this place recharges the souls of a lot of wonderful people. And particularly, I think, of, the, of Leonard Tate who was born in a little cabin over here. Uh, he called it Holla Head, Head of the Holla. And uh, his sister, Clarabelle, went to New Orleans and played at the Jung Hotel when, uh, for 40 years, I guess. She played a piano in one hand, an organ in the other, and sang all those wonderful songs we love and some of the ones we don't uh, know as well. But uh, she was a premier entertainer, and she used to come back and regale people at the crafts fair with her art. Her brother was a wonderful local artist. Um, her younger brother, Leon, or Leonard Tate, was a poet. And uh, Leonard Tate said, we're mountain people, they tell us, coarse of feature and of speech, with morale as friable as the sandstone of our hills. But all my life, I've wanted to tell them that, yes, we are mountain people but beneath the sandstone of our hills, there's granite in our character. So this is the kind of countryside up here that's uh, really unique and, and worthy, and uh, all of you are on the same wavelength of that sort of thing, so we're gonna have a nice day.